if you would like to make, a, let's say, a 700 watt GPU 100 times faster, what you're ultimately saying is that 700 watt GPU is going to become a 70,000 watt GPU and the chip melts. So the only way you can go fast is by first solving the energy efficiency problem. Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Bowen and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Neurophos. We're building AI inference hardware for data centers using an optical computing technique. Now the reason why we're doing this is because if you were to talk to the major AI developers, what they would tell you is that we fundamentally need 100x more compute as a society in order to really deliver on the overall promise of AI. AI compute is so expensive that it's really only the largest of the big tech companies that can afford the massive compute clusters that are needed to deliver AI. And that really cuts out all of the smaller companies and startups that otherwise would be competing. If you want to be able to do this without us as a society giving 50% of our global GDP to NVIDIA, then we really need to decrease the cost of AI hardware by 100x. Now, the only way you can do that is essentially by making it 100x faster. If you would like to make, a, let's say, a 700 watt GPU 100 times faster, and you do nothing about the fundamental energy efficiency, what you're ultimately saying is that 700 watt GPU is going to become a 70,000 watt GPU and the chip melts. What this does is it ultimately ends up aligning the economic and environmental incentive structures. Now, how do you go about doing that? Well, raw speed per dollar for GPUs today, or silicon in general, is determined by two different factors. There's compute density, so that's basically how fast does each square millimeter of silicon go. And then there's what I would call manufacturing efficiency, which is basically how much does each square millimeter of silicon cost. The product of these two things is basically speed per dollar, right? On the other hand, Compute density, that's a really difficult path as well. You can really only fix that, again, by going back to the fundamental physics. And this is exactly what Neurophos has done. So um, way back in the late 1970s, there was a guy named Kung at Carnegie Mellon who invented something called systolic arrays. And this idea of systolic arrays was instead of in a traditional processor where you're pulling tiny bits of data out of memory and you're just doing one mathematical operation per bit of data from memory, let's pull batches of data from memory. Let's put it in a big systolic processor that does all of the compute on that batch of data that's necessary before you finally send the final result back. And what that can do is massively relieve your memory bandwidth requirements. This was kind of like the genius of the Google TPU team, which is they essentially just resurrected the old idea of systolic arrays from the late 1970s. And a systolic array really is what makes a TPU a TPU. If you look inside that chip, the majority of the chip area is like a massive systolic array and a massive bank of SRAM. That was in 2017. In 2018, there was a flurry of startup companies that decided that they were going to make analog systolic arrays instead of digital ones. This was really interesting, and I think there was a lot of confusion about what exactly it is that analog versions of systolic arrays give you instead of digital ones. But long story short is that a lot of those efforts to build analog systolic arrays ended up failing um, by 2022. And now the industry is kind of in flux and we're not really sure what's coming next. So let me talk through exactly what a systolic array is and what the benefit is that that gives you. So to talk about the benefits of analog systolic arrays and where Neurophos sees this is going, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's talk about digital and memory compute systolic arrays from Kung, what that delivers, and how that changes with analog systolic arrays and how we can then go genuinely 100 times faster. With digital systolic arrays um, in Kung's original concept, the idea is let's have a two-dimensional array of what we would call processing elements. And we're going to set this thing up to do matrix matrix work loads. And so you're going to pull a matrix from memory and you're going to write that matrix one component at a time to all the different processing elements in the two dimensional array. And in every clock cycle, you're going to bring in a row from your second matrix A into the processing elements. What each processing element does is it basically takes some data that's inside of it, takes some data from the left, maybe some data from the top. It does a little bit of math. It passes some data right and it passes some data down to the adjacent processing elements. If you configure these things with the right algorithm, you can set it up to do the matrix matrix multiplication of A times B, for example, and every clock cycle give you another row of essentially the matrix C. Now, what that means is that if you, if you were to look at how systolic arrays scale, starting from a really tiny, let's say one by one systolic array, this is basically the same thing as a CPU. 
where a CPU is basically just taking two reads from memory, does some math, and then writes that final result back to memory. But if you want that thing to do a matrix matrix multiply, that's a ton of data I.O. And more specifically, it's three memory accesses per one mathematical operation you do. That means you need three times the memory bandwidth than you have processing speed at your disposal, and the algorithm just crawls along, most fundamentally being limited by memory bandwidth. Now what happens if you move from a 1 by 1 to, let's say, a 10 by 10 systolic array? What that means is you can now deal with blocks of data from your two large matrices that you're multiplying by. You use block matrix multiplication as the algorithm to get it done, but since you get to pull that data basically many fewer times from memory and do a lot more math per pull from memory, the algorithm accelerates. Now, if you ex increase this size from 10 by 10 to, let's say, 1,000 by 1,000, even big enough to pull your entire matrices from memory into the in-memory compute array, you can basically do the whole algorithm in one shot, just pulling both matrices in and then returning the final result. And every piece of data only gets pulled once from memory and gets reused many, many times for many, many mathematical operations before you return the final result. Now, what are the implications for energy efficiency for this? So since systolic arrays, as you scale them larger and larger, they have fewer memory accesses involved, the overall system becomes more energy efficient as you scale it up. That's basically because you're amortizing the cost of your memory access over many mathematical calculations. But it ends up giving you diminishing returns, some t somewhere around 100 or 200 by 100 or 200 size element arrays you're not really getting that much more benefit by scaling it up anymore, and that's because the power consumption is now more fundamentally limited by the power burn of the systolic array itself instead of the memory bank. That's a kind of a dead end. You could also get more energy efficiency by resorting to CMOS scaling, but unfortunately, that's also a path of diminishing returns. CMOS is not giving us the efficiency gains it once did decades ago. Now what happens to this picture, again, as we move from a digital in-memory processor to an analog in-memory processor? So a digital in-memory processor, we already said every clock cycle, it's basically helping you do a vector matrix multiplication. It's feeding in another vector. The power consumption is going to go as the area. Every single one of these processing elements in the area is doing some math every single clock cycle. When you build an analog systolic array instead, you basically set up some sort of linear physical system that's driven by DACs and ADCs. One set of DACs is basically dedicated to writing in one of the matrices, which you do once, and set that aside. The other set of digital to analog converters, they're feeding you the input vectors, and then a set of analog to digital converters are collecting the output vector signals. And so it's basically doing the same math at the same speed as the digital in-memory processor, but you'll note that the only energy you have to supply to the system for an analog in-memory processor is the digital to analog converters on the front end and the analog to digital converters in the back end. All these DACs and ADCs go as the perimeter instead of as the area. So with the digital in-memory processor, you make it faster by scaling it up, right? You, you go 2x, 3x, 4x the size, and it gets faster and faster and faster as you scale it up. But the power consumption also increases in proportion to the speed. And so the fundamental energy efficiency of the compute itself doesn't really change as you scale it up larger and larger. In contrast with an analog systolic array, even those, though those DACs and ADCs may, on an individual DAC and ADC basis, consume more power than a digital in-memory compute processing element, they only go as the perimeter of the, the analog systolic array instead of the area. But the speed goes as the area. So as you scale it up larger and larger and larger, you're doing the same compute as the digital in-memory compute, but you're consuming less and less total power reg relative to a digital in-memory processor, which means when you add up the overall energy consumption for massive analog systolic arrays, it's negligible compared to the power consumption of digital in-memory compute arrays. Now what about speed, right? The whole purpose of this energy efficiency was to convert it into speed. Well, again, a digital in-memory processor, its speed is determined by two things. It's the size of the systolic array times the clock speed, right? Now, th that clock speed is going to sit somewhere between 1 and 2 gigahertz, just sort of dictated by the technology node. An analog in-memory processor, on the other hand, it its speed is determined by the size and the clock speed in the same way. But what determines the clock speed? In this case, the clock speed is determined by how long it takes the signals to propagate from the digital to analog converters on the front end over to the ADCs.
Now, if you do this with analog electronics, what you end up ultimately doing is using some massive network of capacitors and resistors in order to be your linear physical system that does the matrix multiplication. But unfortunately, those capacitors and resistors incur delays in the propagation of the signals through the analog circuit, and those delays are in proportion to the size of the circuit. As you scale it up, it takes longer and longer, unfortunately, for the signals to propagate through your analog systolic array, which means as you're scaling it up, trying to make it more and more energy efficient, you actually have to slow down the clock speed. And so what this means is that even though analog electronic systolic arrays can give you massive gains in energy efficiency, it's not delivering that in a, a physics format that allows you to easily convert that energy efficiency into speed. So then what happens if instead of using analog electronics, we move from an analog electronic systolic array to an optical systolic array? Now the speed at which the signals propagate from your AD DACs on the front end to your ADCs on the back end is literally at the speed of light. We can clock these things at 10, 20, 50, and even more up to 100 gigahertz. Um, and still not be impacted by the latency of the optical signals through the system, which, which is what allows you to convert that energy efficiency finally into speed. So again, recapping, digital in-memory compute ends up giving you diminishing returns. As you scale it larger, it's limited by the fundamental power consumption of this digital systolic array itself. But optical in-memory compute Every time you double the size, you double the energy efficiency, and you can convert that energy efficiency into speed, meaning it's unbounded now in terms of size instead of bounded like digital and memory compute was. Now, people have actually already tried to build this using silicon, traditional silicon photonics. Unfortunately, the problem that people ran into is what is the optical modulator, basically the equivalent of the optical transistor in silicon photonics, is massive. These things can be a millimeter long on chip, which means you can only make relatively small arrays on the order of, let's say, 64 by 64, maybe 100 by 100. And where that leaves you is something that is around the same energy efficiency and speed as digital CMOS today. It's limited in terms of its scaling because of the size of those components. So what is the dream AI accelerator tensor core. You, we've so far covered that it needs to be dense, meaning you have to have really small modulators so you can fit many of them on chip and achieve those scaling laws. It needs to be analog so that you have the right scaling laws involved. It needs to be photonic so you're not limited by the RC delays through the system. You can clock this thing at the speed of light. It needs to be volatile. There are a lot of other analog electronic and memory compute technologies, specifically the RERAMs in particular, that are non-volatile technologies, in which case you can't run transformers on them. It needs to be true black box operation. There are a lot of people who tried to build analog um, AI systems where the customer had to custom train their neural network to your processor. That's a no-go because one of the most valuable things about AI is that we basically can copy the brains exactly across multiple instances of the hardware. It needs to support multiple number formats because that's arguably one of the most f one of the fastest moving things about AI algorithms today. You need to do fixed and floating point, um, and it needs to be easily manufacturable and co-packaged. Now, before I tell you how Neurophos is achieving this magical AI tensor core, let me go back to one last incredibly impractical idea from the late 1970s, which is the Goodman type vector matrix multiplication engine. And Goodman was the guy who basically wrote the textbook on Fourier optics. And his idea was, let's take a 1D vector of light and let's pass that through a cylindrical lens. That cylindrical lens is going to do a copy in the other dimension of space, spreading the light across the other dimension. And then you're going to project that light onto a two-dimensional holographic film that represents your matrix. Each point on it represents a different component of the matrix. That does a point-wise multiplication of your copied input vector with the matrix in the holographic film. That light then passes through a second cylindrical lens, which is rotated in the other dimension, to do a focus. That focus is the equivalent of a sum, and so what you get is the vector matrix multiplication of your input vector times the matrix in the 2D holographic film. Now, this idea, as I said, is in completely impractical, and the reason why it's completely impractical is because this would, in theory, be three separate chips that are located at three separate positions in space, separated by lenses and stuff, and um, the electronics communications overhead in between these chips that you would have to establish at really high speeds would just kill you. So let's take that idea and instead fold it in half twice. 
Now what you can do is place all three of those chips on the same plane, folded in half twice using a beam splitter, so that your input vectors and output vectors and 2D matrix representation chips, all three of them are really close to each other and 3D stacked on top of a standard CMOS electrical chip with a dense through silicon via array that provides really high bandwidth to sort of feed the beast of this massive optical and memory compute processor. Now, the thing is, that's all great in theory. How do you actually build it? And where do you find this really dense array of two-dimensional optical modulators? That is Neurofos's metasurface technology. What we did is went back to the fundamental physics and reinvented what is essentially the optical transistor, the optical modulator, to something that is 8,000 times smaller than the opti optical modulators you get from standard CMOS today allowing us to make arrays that are in the thousands by thousands in a really small chip area. Now, when you put that together in that same package and you collect, you pr use silicon photonics to provide your input vectors and collect your output vectors, where does this technology go? If we were to pursue this roadmap sort of as a society into the future, what does the road mo roadmap look like? Well, the speed of this device is basically the size of the metasurface you would build times the speed of the silicon photonics. The speed of the silicon photonics you can get from standard foundry PDKs clocked up to 50 gigahertz. And the size of the metasurface, if you look at you know, how big of a metasurface you could build, it would be about 12 meg megabytes or 12 million elements. So if you multiply those three numbers together, what you get is 1.2 million tera operations per second and state-of-the-art GPUs is at 2,000 tera operations per second. So that's where the roadmap takes you. Now, we're not going to start there, obviously, because it's a monumental task to build such a large system, but we can build something much smaller that easily gives us two orders of magnitude and a product concept that has you know, two silicon photonic chips and a metasurface chip 3D stacked on top of an EIC die, all 2.5D packaged with HBM, essentially in the same way that we manufacture GPUs today. Now, all of that stuff, that 100x improvement in power, in, in, in raw compute speed, is most fundamentally supported by 100x improvement in energy efficiency. So what you're doing is you're delivering the raw compute speed of 100 GPUs in the form factor of one GPU and the power consumption of one GPU. That's monumental gains for the industry. Now, let's talk about the roadmap and you know history and recoup. Where have AI processors been? And where are we going today? We started with CPUs, right, which were really limited, ultimately by memory bandwidth, right? For every mathematical operation you wanted to perform, you had to do three memory accesses. The genius of Kung, and then what was resurrected by the Google TPU team, was we can use in-memory processors to essentially really lower the memory access energy involved in order to complete the workload. Now, in moving from digital in-memory to analog in-memory, what we unlock is the ability to also really reduce the fundamental compute energy, which via Amdahl's law allows the overall system now to have massive, massive gains in terms of energy efficiency. But unfortunately, if you implement that with analog electronics, it's really hard to convert that energy efficiency into speed. And so instead, by implementing this with photonics, we can finally not only be orders of magnitude more energy efficient, but we can convert that energy efficiency into speed, which is what you need to do in order to have orders of magnitude reduction in the cost of AI inference hardware. Thanks for taking a look, guys. We're really excited to be on this journey with everyone.